Hi, everybody. This is the last of the recordings I've on, on the Flower Ornament Sutra. I am so excited about it. And um, I'm so thankful to everyone who enabled me to do this, this 1,515-page uh, reading, which I'm amazed that I did. <laughs> I only meant to honor the dear, my, the dear Thomas Cleary, the late departed dear Thomas Cleary. And, um, and I really did honor him in the sense that I even discovered things that I had not even realized and appreciated about his tremendous achievement in doing this translation and giving his heart and his life and his effort and his genius to doing it. It's truly amazing, actually. And uh, he did it in the teeth of so many academic Buddhist studies like uh, big shot professors who in, the, in his field who sneered and snobbed and who actually couldn't hold a candle to him in regard to really understanding what this is all about. Although that some of them were good philologists at something, but you know, the, this, this kind of thing is, you know, what was it? After I translated one of the most difficult centrist philosophical works in the Tibetan canon, my friend and senior colleague, the late David C. Ford Ray, one of the greatest scholar I believe in, the in a generation, maybe my generation, but or maybe previous to me, sort of half a generation above me. Uh, he gave a talk at Columbia at my invitation, which he entitled, Do You Have to Understand the Work in Order to Translate it Properly? <laughs> at the time, I was really dubious whether he meant it as a compliment or a critique. He had read it thoroughly, I know, my translation. And maybe he wasn't sure he understood it all. So, of course, he wasn't sure I understood it all. But in a way, he also was complimenting by saying translated properly. Because I think he was, in the, he was implying that maybe it was properly translated, but probably I didn't fully understand it. And that was the correct thing, actually. <laughs> and I maybe understand it a little better now, but I probably still don't. So completely. So anyway, so that's so now enough about me, but it's, uh, it's just wonderful. It's a wonderful thing. And there's a, I want to read also, I'm also thankful to Li Tong Xuan, whose commentary, who uh, is from, you know, probably Ta late Tang Dynasty. I'm sorry, he says here, but I forget what was his um, time, Li Tong Xuan. And of course, to... Uh, Shikshananda, the, who translated this, um, the educated joy, uh, who educated, who translated into Chinese from Sanskrit, of course, all the Chinese people who did it. I want to thank all of them, but I'll do that later. Anyway, I want to go back a little bit. I think I read the very short Manjushri number 52, his last of the 52 teachers, um, Sudhana's uh, next to last Manjushri. So I thought I would read Li Tong Shan's analysis of the Manjushri chapter, and then uh, and then read it. It's only a paragraph in the original. So he says, "Then Maitreya sent Sudhana back to see his first benefactor, Manjushri." And in a way, Manjushri understand this. Remember, there's a hundred thousand Manjushris in one of the assemblies earlier, coming from a hundred thousand different Buddha verses <coughs> to celebrate. Shakyamuni, when he has first attained enlightenment in the first part, you know, where you're having these huge, cosmic, really sci-fi type of assemblies of masses of bodhisattvas, millions from different worlds and universes, who all appear without, of course, having to leave where they are because they're highly advanced. And they appear <coughs> to celebrate Shakyamuni. And, and each one of them are led by a Manjushri, and there are 100,000 Manjushris, therefore, that come, which is probably just a, also just a symbolic number for countless numbers of Manjushris. Because a Manjushri, is, a, although supposedly a Bodhisattva, is, of course, the Buddha of perfect wisdom. He is the same as the female Prajnaparamita, the mother goddess Sophia, uh, transcendent Sophia. And she is, he is, uh, and so he is actually the wisdom of all Buddha. So, of course, he can, and then, and then, so he explains this nicely, the Li Tong Zhuan here. So I just wanted to read that. So then Maitreya sent Sudhana back to see his first benefactor, Manjushri. 
showing that the ultimate result is the same as the cause, because the way into eternity of the silent function of universally illumined knowledge is not of the past, present, or future, and has no beginning or end, no exit or entry. <laughs> That's Buddhahood. That's really wonderful. No exit or entry. A Tom's translation is wonderful. Li Tongzhan's commentary and insight is wonderful. Great Chinese master. And, uh, and of course, the sutra is marvelous. So then I traveled through 110 cities to see Manjushri, representing simultaneously cert simultaneous certainty of the principles he had practiced. The unity of all Buddhas and sentient beings in the same one real universe is the place where Manjushri is seen. So, and the 110 number is like the 112, 32 major and 80 minor signs, minus two, I don't know what the two minus are, but those are the different petals of the chakras in the Guya Samaja uh, uh, subtle body system. The 110 is really amazing. So again, it's a symbolic number of everywhere in all it's, it's of, of the subtle body, the magic body. Wonderful. Manjushri reached out over 110 leagues to lay his right hand on Sunab Sudana's head, pray, patting him on the head, anointing him, that is, christening him, praising his ability to set out on these practical undertakings and be received by spiritual friends on each level of the 52 levels of going from an ordinary person to Buddha. He, then he had Sudana fulfill countless teachings and had him enter the sphere of the practice of universally good. And this is another even more subtle version of the infinite goodness of the ultimate realm, of the actual reality of the world, which is what is already here, has always been here. <clears throat> and this, this suffering, this ignorance and everything is only illusory. But still, as illusion, it's taken seriously out of compassion as a serious illusion. And its liberation is a serious illusion. And Buddhahood is a serious illusion. But then he says something is shocking. So, laying the hand on the head symbolizes mutual identification of cause and effect. So his touching his head is a unity of Manjushri and Sudhana, he's saying, in Sudhana's Buddhahood, actually. The 110 leagues symbolize having passed through the causes and effects of the five ranks. And those are the five paths, you know, path of preparation, path of accumulation, or path, yeah, path of gathering stores or accumulation, path of application, prayoga marga, path of vision, path of meditation, and path of no more learning. And then the five ranks will be in the Huayan school, the flower ornament school in China. Maybe they have another set that is surely parallel to that, but they will elaborate it possibly in a different way that I, I'm not sure. Introduction to the realm of the practice of universal good, Samantabhadra, means introduction to perpetual practice of universal good after the fruition of Buddhahood. So universal good is the way Buddha is in every universe, in every atom, simultaneously, infinitely present, embodied, in infinite subatomic and subatomic and subatomic embodiments. So in a way, it's the unbroken plane of the clear light of the void, of clear light of bliss. But uh, as a being, as a universally goody-goody being, the goody-goody that my, my Brahma-identifiable Sanskrit teacher uh, uh, talked about, what irked him about Buddhism, but there was everybody was a goody-goody. <laughs> Bunch of them goody-goodies, he said. After, but though he admitted he would like to meet only goody goodies in his life. After establishing Sudhana in his own place, Manjushri disappeared, illustrating how after the fruition of Buddhahood, one is not different from when one was among ordinary mortals. Whoops. After one attains Buddhahood, Buddha is basically non-existent. So Manjushri disappeared. That's a shocker and a great. Well, but you know, one is not different 
from what, when one was among ordinary mortals, which just meant that one discovers that one was already a Buddha, even when one was ordinary, but one didn't know it then, because illusorily one was ignorant and so was suffering and feeling separated from the goodness of the universe and not sure about it. So, but still, that was a mistake. That's why one, you're no different. But of course, you are vastly different in that you are free of your, you're like the magician in the illusion rather than someone taken in by the illusion. Okay. And then after one attains Buddhahood, Buddha is basically non-existent, meaning Buddha only has meaning in relationship dualistically to non-Buddha. Once you realize that everything is Buddha, every atom, every life is Buddha, you know, freedom, life is bliss, life is freedom, life is infinite energy, life is inconceivable, actually, but obviously livable, then you don't need Buddha, because everything is. Since language can't encompass it. So you can say, basically, basically non-existent, so Manjushri disappeared. Sudhana saw as many spiritual benefactors as atoms in a billion world universe in the sense that knowledge of the body of reality pervades the real universe evenly. So he knew everything everywhere and every when as no different from the body of Manjushri, the personification of wisdom in the illusory world as if it were something different from ignorance. <clears throat> okay? But actually there is no such ignorance and therefore in a way there's no wisdom it's beyond the duality of wisdom and ignorance. Okay, which is a language. Finally, in front of the Buddha's seat at the diamond mine site of enlightenment, Sudhana escalated his awareness to the vastness of space, whereby he saw Samantabhadra universally good sitting on a jewel lotus in front of the Buddha. This means that the aftermath of the fruition of Buddhahood is ultimately not apart from the subtle principle of enlightenment, the diamond mine of knowledge in the first attitude of faith, yet it activates the cosmic network of perpetual practice. <laughs> so, you know, how can scholars really be jealous of this as they were of Thomas Cleary when he was alive? It's really shattering that human beings can be like that. That's, that sentence is so perfect, you know. Ultimately, not apart from the subtle principle of enlightenment. Principle, he translates from Chinese, li. But it's also from tattva in, in Sanskrit, thatness. Thatness. The thatness of enlightenment. The diamond it could be thisness too, thisness, thatness, or thusness. There's no more duality between thatness and thusness of imminence and transcendence. So thatness. So he calls a principle. The diamond mind of knowledge in the first attitude of faith, sitting in front of the Buddha, as Samantabhadra, yet it activates the cosmic network of perpetual practice, because everywhere is a Bodhisattva practicing. Samantabhadra extended his right hand and laid it on Sudhana's head, whereupon Sudhana attained as many concentrations as atoms in all Buddha verses. And just as Samantabhadra laid his hand on Sudhana's head here, so did each Samantabhadra from before every Buddha, in every atom, every world, in the ten directions, also lay his hand on Sudhana's head. And Sudhana attained the same spiritual experience. So Sudhana becomes all beings. It's like Christ becomes everyone. Christ doesn't wait to get you after death or at some final judgment or some other such nonsense. Christ liberates you instantly, in other words. That is the Christ job. You know. So did every Samantabhadra before every Buddha in every atom of every world in, every, in the ten directions also lay his hand on Sudhana's head. And Sudhana attained the same spiritual experience. This illustrates the eternal Buddhahood of the real universe and its eternal practice of universal good. Only upon reaching and according with these do you realize the Buddhas are already enlightened and universal good is already in action. It also illustrates how the fulfillment of practice is not apart from cause. Time does not shift. Knowledge does not alter. With each step in the Buddha fields, in the pores of universal good, so then across untold worlds, but even traveling thus throughout the aeons of the future, 
one could not know the limits of the order of succession of oceans of lands in a single pore, of the matrices of oceans of lands, of the differences in oceans of lands, of the interpretation, interpenetration of oceans of lands, or of the formation and disintegration of oceans of lands. One could not know the limits of the oceans of Buddhas or the oceans of congregations of enlightening beings. This is because such is the reality of the vast realm of infinite practice of universal good, Samantabhadra. Then Sudara attained the ocean of practical vows of Samantabhadra, equal to universal good and equal to the Buddhas, filling all worlds with one body, equal in sphere, equal in practice, equal in true awareness, equal in spiritual powers, equal in teaching, equal in kindness and compassion, equal in the freedom of inconceivable liberation. This illustrates how the ocean of infinite practices is carried out by all Buddhas of all times and places. This is the ultimate enlightenment in which there are no more ideas of attaining Buddhahood or not attaining Buddhahood. Really, Li Tong Xuan, thank you so much. Thomas Cleary, thank you so much. Okay, now for the, for the reading of the actual prayer of Samantabhadra, which we could make a daily practice, although there's a little preliminary to it, which will take a little while. Just to read again the Manjushri moment. Then Sudana, passing more than 110 cities, went to Sumana Mukha and stayed there thinking about Manjushri, wishing to see and meet with Manjushri. Then Manjushri extended his hand over 110 leagues and laid it on the head of Sudana, who was standing in the city of Sumana Mukha, and said, Good, good, sadhu, sadhu. Those without the faculty of faith, those who are weary or sluggish in mind, those who have not accumulated efforts, those whose vigor recedes, those who are satisfied with meager virtues, those imbued with only one root of goodness, those unskilled in carrying out practical vows, those who are not in the care of spiritual benefactors, those who are not minded by the Buddhas, cannot know this true nature, this principle, this sphere, this abode. They are unable to know, to fathom, to penetrate, to believe, to conceive, to know exactly or to attain. Having Kusudana to cause, cause Sudhana to see by means of his spiritual statement, having directed him, inspired him, gladdened him, imbued him with countless facets of truth, illumined him with the great light of infinite knowledge, led him into the endless mental command of memory, presence of mind, concentration, and super-knowledge of enlightening beings, plunged him into the sphere of universally good practice, and established him in his own place, Manjushri left the presence of Sudhana and disappeared. Now we come to, to Samantabhadra section, the final one. This Sudhana, attending as many spiritual benefactors as atoms in a billion world universe, his mind having accumulated the provisions for omniscience, acting on the instructions of all spiritual benefactors with correct understanding, his mind equally attentive to all spiritual friends, his intellect in harmony with all spiritual friends without emotion, following the ocean of principles of the advice and instruction of all spiritual friends, filled with universal compassion, illumining all beings with universal love, meaning that without even seeing them, just completely flooding them with universal love, because with filling with universal compassion means you don't see any being. You see this being who is not blissful. You see every being is fully made of bliss, illumining all beings with universal love, physically blissful, abiding at peace in the vast liberation of enlightening beings, his equanimous vision attentive to all dimensions, having accomplished the ocean of virtues of all Buddhas, on the path of resolve of all Buddhas, strengthened by the energy of vigor of preparation for omniscience, his mind thoroughly dedicated to the will of all enlightening beings, comprehending the succession of all Buddhas of past, present, and futures, awake to the ocean of principles of all enlightened teachings, 
following the ocean of principles of the wheels of teaching of all Buddhas in the realm of manifesting reflections of life in all worlds, immersed in the principles of the vows of all enlightening beings, set out to carry on enlightening practice throughout all ages, seeing the realm of omniscience, having developed all the faculties of enlightening beings, aware of the path of omniscience, his intellect focused on all the principles of the reality realm, illumining the principles of all lands, following the course of beneficial action extending to all beings, shattering the precipitous mountain of spiritual impediments, according with the unimpeded nature of reality, abiding at peace in the liberation of enlightening beings, beings, containing the universal reality realm, investigating the realm of all Buddhas, empowered by all Buddhas, stood contemplating the realm of the enlightening being, universally good. <clears throat> Having heard the name of the enlightening being, universally good, his practice of enlightenment, the excellence of his vow, the excellence of basing his undertaking on the pre provisions for enlightenment of, of, of merit and knowledge, the excellence of his expertise and accomplishment, his conduct in the stage of universal good, his preparations for the stages, the excellence of his attainment, the speed of his attainment of the stages, his entry into the stages, his stabilization in the stages, his progress through the stages, his importance in the stages, his mastery of the stages, and his abiding in the stages, Sudhana, eager to see the enlightening being Samantabhadra universally good, sat on a lotus seat of jewels facing the lion throne of the Buddha on the enlightenment site, there filled with oceans of diamonds, with a mind as vast as space and free from all attachments, with perception of all lands well developed, with a mind having transcended all barriers and clingings, with a mind unimpeded, in the realm of non-obstruction in the midst of all things, with a mind freely pervading everywhere without hindrance, with a pure mind entering the realm of omniscience, with a well-ordered mind purified by observing the ornaments of the sight of enlightenment, with a broad mind immersed in the ocean of all enlightened teachings, with a vast mind pervading all realms of jewels, numerous as atoms in all Buddha lands, emanate from every pore, filling the assemblies of all Buddhas and showering on them to fulfill the wishes of all beings. He saw clouds of jeweled trees, as many as atoms in all Buddha lands, emanate from every pore, filling all universes in space, adorning them with blooming jeweled trees and showering great rains of jewels on the audiences of all Buddhas. He saw multitudes of embodiments of celestial beings, as many as atoms in all Buddha lands, emanate from every pore, filling all worlds, praising the enlightening being. He saw multitudes of phantom embodiments of the celestial beings in all the Brahma worlds, emanating from every pore, asking, asking the enlightened Buddhas to turn the wheel of the teaching. He saw multitudes of embodiments of all the celestials in the realm of desire emanate from every pore, receiving the cycles of teachings of all Buddhas. He saw multitudes of all Buddha lands of past, present, and future, as many as atoms in all Buddha lands emanate from each pore in each mental moment, pervading all universes throughout space as places of rest, salvation, and refuge for beings with no place of rest, no savior, no refuge. He saw multitudes of all Buddha lands, as many as atoms in all Buddha lands, filled with congregations of inspired enlightening beings, emanate from every pore, pervading all universes throughout space, conducive to the purification of beings of lofty resolve. He saw multitudes of pure lands with defilement, as many as atoms in all Buddha lands, emanate from every pore in each moment of thought, pervading all universes throughout space, conducive to the purification of defiled beings. He saw multitudes of defiled lands with mental purity, as many as atoms in all Buddha lands, emanate from every pore in each moment of thought, pervading all universes throughout space, conducive to the purification of wholly defiled beings. He saw multitudes of embodiments of all enlightening beings, as many as atoms in all Buddha lands, emanate from every pore in each instant of consciousness, pervading all universes throughout space, adapting to the conduct of all beings and developing all beings to supreme perfect enlightenment. He saw multitudes of embodiments of enlightening beings, as many as atoms in all Buddha lands, emanate from every pore in each mental moment, pervading all universes throughout space, invoking the names of all Buddhas in order to increase the roots of goodness of all beings. 
He saw multitudes of embodiments of enlightening beings, as many as atoms in all Buddha lands, emanating from every pore, pervading all universes throughout space, in all Buddha lands, preserved, presenting the accomplishments of all roots of goodness of all enlightening beings from the first arousal of the aspiration for enlightenment. He saw as many multitudes of enlightening beings as atoms and all Buddha lands emanate from every pore in each and every Buddha land, illustrating the oceans of vows of all enlightening beings for the perfection of the practice of universally good enlightening beings. He saw as many clouds of practices of the enlightening being universally good as atoms in all Buddha lands emanate from every pore, causing showers, fulfilling the wishes of all beings, increasing the flood of joy of attainment of omniscience. He also saw as many clouds of perfect enlightenment as atoms in all Buddha verses emanating from every pore, showing perfect enlightenment in all Buddha lands, increasing the great spiritual energy of attainment of omniscience. Then Sudhana, having seen this manifestation of universally good's mystic power, happy, fulfilled, enraptured, uplifted, delighted, joyful, contemplated the body of universally good further, and saw from every part of his body and every pore the billionfold world with its ma masses of air, earth, and fire, its oceans, continents, rivers, jewel mountains, polar mountains, peripheral mountains, villages, cities, towns, communities, district, forests, dwellings, populations, bells, animal realms, underworlds, realms of titans, dragons, birds, humans, and celestials, realms of desires, formless realms, its bases, foundations, and forms, its clouds, lightning, stars, nights, days, and fortnights, half years and years, intermediate aeons and aeons. And as he saw this world in the same way, he saw all the worlds to the east. And as in the east, he saw all the worlds in all directions, in the south, west, north, northeast, southeast, southwest, northwest, the nadir and the zenith. By way of reflection, he saw the emergence of all Buddhas, along with their circles of enlightening beings, as well as other beings. And he saw the succession of all enlightening beings in the worlds in past aeons in this world. He saw the succession of all worlds in past aeons in this world, all that in one mark of greatness of the body of universally good. They like the emergence of his, like his earlobes. The emergence of all the Buddhas, the circles of the enlightening beings, the sentient beings, the abodes, the days and nights, the ages. In the same way, he also saw all the Buddha lands of the future. And just as he saw the succession of past and future worlds in this world, in the same way, he saw the successions of all past and future worlds in all worlds in the ten directions, through each mark of greatness and in each pore on the body of the enlightening being universally good, all in perfect order, not mixed up with one another. And just as he saw the enlightening being universally good, sitting on a great jewel lotus calyx lion seat, lion throne before Vairochana Buddha, displaying this miracle. Likewise, he saw him displaying the same miracle in the world, Padma Shri, of the Bhadra Shri Buddha in the East. And as in the East, he also saw the enlightening being universally good, sitting on a jeweled lotus, calyx, lion throne, in the presence of all Buddhas in all worlds, everywhere, displaying this same miracle. And from each individual body of universally good, he saw all objects of past, present, and future appearing in reflections, and likewise saw all lands, all beings, all Buddhas emerging, and all congregations of enlightening beings appearing as reflections. And he heard the voices of all beings, the voices of all Buddhas, the turning of the wheel of teaching of all Buddhas, the presentation of all advice and instruction, the attainments of the enlightening beings, and the mystic powers of all Buddhas. Having seen and heard this inconceivable miracle of the enlightening being universally good, he attained ten states of consummation of knowledge. What were these ten? He attained the state of consummation of knowledge, physically pervading all Buddha lands in a moment of thought. He attained the state of consummation of holistic knowledge going to the presence of all Buddhas. He attained the state of consummation of knowledge of spiritual benefactors. No, 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 no. Serving all Buddhas, I'm sorry. He attained the consummation of knowledge serving all Buddhas. He attained the state of consummation of knowledge asking about the teaching and receiving answers from each and every Buddha. He attained the state of consummation of knowledge of meditation and the cycles of teachings of all Buddhas. 
He attained the state of consummation of knowledge of the inconceivable miracles of Buddhas. He attained the state of consummation of knowledge to expound one expression of truth forever by means of inexhaustible specific knowledge of all truths. He attained the state of consummation of direct knowledge of the ocean of all truths. He attained the state of consummation of knowledge of all principles of the realm of reality. He attained the state of consummation of knowledge to live together with the thoughts of all beings. He attained the state of consummation of knowledge of instantaneous direct witness of the practice of the enlightening being universally good. Samandabhadra. In Sudhana, who had realized these states of consummate knowledge, universally good Samandabhadra extended his right hand and laid it on his head. With universally good's hand on Sudhana's head, as many concentrations as atoms in all Buddha lands entered into Sudhana, and by each concentration he entered into as many oceans of worlds as atoms in all Buddha verses, as many hitherto unseen provisions for omniscience as atoms in all Buddha verses accrued to him, as many origins of elements of omniscience as atoms in all Buddha lands became manifest to him. He rose up for as many great undertakings for the omniscience as atoms in all Buddha lands. He entered into as many oceans of vows as atoms in all Buddha verses. He went forth in as many emancipating paths of omniscience as atoms in all Buddha verses. He was involved in as many practices of enlightening beings as atoms in all Buddha lands. He was honored by as many floods of omniscience as atoms in all Buddha lands. He was illumined by as many lights of knowledge of all Buddhas as atoms in all Buddha lands. Just as in this world, in the presence of Ayurachana Buddha, the enlightening being universally good, extended his right hand and laid it on Sudhana's head. In the same way, universally good, sitting at the feet of all Buddhas in all worlds, extended his right hand and laid it on Sudhana's head. In the same way, sitting at the feet of all Buddhas in all worlds, within the atoms of all worlds, universally good extended his right hand and laid it on Sudhana's head. And just as facets of truth entered Sudhana, as he was touched by the hand of universally good at the feet of Virochana Buddha, likewise facets of truth entered Sudhana in various ways as he was touched by the multitudes of hands extended from the bodies of all the universally good Samantabhadras. Then the great enlightening being universally good said to Sudhana, did you see my mystical projection? Sudhana said, I saw noble one, but only a Buddha could understand such an inconceivable mystical projection. Universally good said, I practice for as many aeons as atoms and untold Buddha verses, seeking the mind of omniscience. And in each immense aeon, I associated with as many Buddhas as Adams and untold Buddha land to purify the aspiration for enlightenment. And in each immense aeon, I made great sacrifices, giving away everything announced in all worlds, fulfilling all beings, storing virtue for omniscience. And in each immense aeon, I made as many great sacrifices as Adams and untold Buddha verses extreme sacrifices, seeking the quality of omniscience. And in each immense aeon I gave up my body, cartoon untold numbers of times, and I gave up kingships, villages, cities, towns, counties, and communities, and I gave up dearly beloved companions so hard to give up, and I gave up spouses and children. I gave away the flesh of my own body and gave blood from my own body to beggars, and I gave away my bones and marrow. I gave away my limbs, my ears and nose, my eyes and tongue, caring only for Buddha knowledge and not for any physical life. In each immense aeon, I gave away as many of my own bodies as atoms in untold Buddha verses, seeking from my own bodies the unsurpassed head of omniscience which rises beyond all worlds. And as I did in each immense aeon, so also did I to, did I, did I do in oceans of great aeons as numerous as atoms and untold Buddha verses. In each immense aeon I honored and served as many Buddhas as atoms and untold Buddha lands, providing food and clothing, shelter, furniture, medicine, and other necessities. And I went forth into the tutelage of each Buddha, applied the instructions of all Buddhas, and I told their teaching, I hold their teachings. I do not know of a single thought in all those oceans of aeons in which I neglected the instructions of the Buddhas. 
I am not aware of having had a single malicious thought in all those aeons, or an egocentric thought, or a selfish thought of possession, or a thought of difference between self and others, or a thought of parting from the path of enlightening beings, or a thought of weariness at staying in the world, or a thought of depression, or a thought deluded by hindrances, or any thought apart from the aspiration for enlightenment, the invulnerable asylum of invincible knowledge directed toward preparations for omniscience. <laughs> As ocean, all oceans of aeons would be exhausted in telling of my past efforts to purify Buddha lands, my compassionate efforts to save, develop, and purify all beings, my efforts to serve Buddhas, my efforts in listening to teachers in quest of truth, my self-sacrifice for the sake of absorbing truth, my sacrifice of life to protect truth. Of all the oceans of teachings, there is not a single statement that I did not get by giving up rulership that I did not get by giving up all that exists, by undertaking the salvation of all beings, by contemplating my own being, by undertaking to attain higher states ahead, by undertaking to produce the light of all worldly knowledge, by undertaking to produce the light of all transmundane knowledge, by undertaking to produce mundane happiness for all sentient beings, by undertaking to tell of the virtues of all Buddhas, Thus it would take up as many aeons as atoms and untold Buddha lands to tell of the accomplishments of my past endeavors. By such power of preparation, power of accomplishment, of assemblage of the root causes, power of lofty resolution, power of accomplishment of virtues, power of contemplation of all truths as they are, power of the eye of wisdom, power bestowed by Buddha, power of great vows, power of great compassion, power of thoroughly purified mystic knowledge, power of the care of spiritual benefactors. I attain the ultimately pure body of reality, which is continuous and unfragmented throughout past, present, and future. I also purified an unexcelled physical body beyond all worldlings, appearing to all beings according to their mentalities, omnipresent in all Buddha verses, abiding everywhere, showing all kinds of mystical pro group projections everywhere, visible in all worlds. Look at this body I have achieved, produced over endless multitudes of aeons, hard to get to appear even in decillions of aeons, hard to get to see. Beings who have not planted roots of goodness cannot even hear of me, much less see me. There are beings who become irreversible on their way to supreme perfect enlightenment just by hearing my name. There are those who become irreversible just by seeing me. Those who become irreversible just by contact with me. Those who become irreversible just by following me <laughs> on Twitter or Facebook. So the Badra should be there. Those who become irreversible just by associating with me. Those who become irreversible by seeing me in a dream. And those who become irreversible on the way to supreme perfect enlightenment by hearing my name in a dream. Some beings become mature by remembering me for a day and a night. Some become mature remembering me for a fortnight. Some a month, some a year, some a century. Some an aeon, some a hundred aeons, some up to as many aeons as atoms in untold Buddha verses. Some become mature, remembering me for one lifetime, some a hundred lifetimes, some up to as many lifetimes as atoms in untold Buddha verses. Some become mature by seeing my radiance, some, become, some by seeing emanations of light beams, some by feeling the earthquake, some by seeing my physical form, some by being encouraged. Thus the beings become irreversible towards supreme perfect enlightenment through as many aeons, through as many arts and means and techniques as atoms in a Buddha land. Furthermore, the whatever, whoever hears of the purity of my Buddha verse shall be born in pure Buddha verses, and whoever sees the purity of my body will be born in my body. Behold the purity of this body of mine. Wow. Then Sudhana, contemplating the body of the enlightening being universally good, saw in each and every pore untold multitudes of Buddha verses filled with Buddhas. And in each Buddha verse he saw the Buddha surrounded by assemblies of enlightening beings. And he saw that all those multitudes of lands had various bases, various forms, various arrays, various perimeters, various clouds covering the skies, various Buddhas appearing, various enunciations of cycles of the teaching. And just as he saw this in each pore, so also in all pores at once, 
in all the marks of greatness, all the embellishments, all the limbs and parts of the body. And in each he saw multitudes of lands with as many multitudes of projected bodies of Buddhas as atoms in all Buddha lands, emerging and filling all worlds in the ten directions, developing beings towards supreme perfect enlightenment. Then Sudhana, then edified by the advice and instruction of the enlightening being universally good, entered into all the worlds within the body of universally good and developed a being toward maturity. Furthermore, the lights of knowledge and goods of goodness accumulated by Sudhana in going to, meeting and attending as many spiritual benefactors as atoms in a Buddhaverse did not amount to even a minute fraction not to any calculable fraction of his accumulation of roots of goodness concomitant with seeing universally good Samantabhadra. As many successful Buddha lands as he had entered from his first determination up to his seeing universally good Samantabhadra, he entered more successive oceans of Buddha lands with attributes as numerous as atoms in untold Buddha lands in a single pour of universally good in each moment of thought. And as in one pour, so in all pours, in each moment of thought, passing as many worlds as atoms in untold Buddha verses, passing the worlds of endless aeons at a step. He still did not come to the end. He did not come to the end of the succession of oceans of lands, of the matrices of oceans of lands, of the differentiations of oceans of lands, of the interpenetrations of oceans of lands, and of the origins of untold oceans of Buddha verses, and of the dissolution of oceans of lands, and of the arrays of oceans of lands, and of the matrices of oceans of appearances of Buddhas, and of the interpenetrations of oceans of appearances of Buddhas, of the origins of oceans of appearances of Buddhas, of the dissolution of oceans of appearances of Buddhas, of the the oceans of congregations of enlightening beings, of the successions of oceans of congregations of enlightening beings, the matrices of oceans of congregations of enlightening beings, the differentiations of oceans of congregations of enlightening beings, the unity of oceans of congregations of enlightening beings, the formations of oceans of congregations of enlightening beings, the dissolution of oceans of congregations of enlightening beings, the entrances of realms of sentient beings, the entrances of instantaneous knowledge of faculties of sentient beings, the penetrations of knowledge of sentient beings, faculties, the developmental guidance of sentient beings, the profound states of occult powers of enlightening beings, or the multitudes of enlightening beings' accessions to and supersessions of the stages. He traveled and contemplated in a land for an aeon, in another for up to as many as aeons as atoms and untold Buddha verses, without moving from that land. In each moment of consciousness, he entered mundane oceans of lands and developed sentient beings towards supreme perfect enlightenment. This continued as he gradually attained equality with the universally good Samantha Bhadra in terms of the ocean of vows of practice of the universally good enlightening beings, equality with all Buddhas, equality of pervasion of all lands, equality of fulfillment of practices, equality of manifestation of the miracle of attainment of enlightenment, equality of the miracle of the attainment of enlightenment, equality of turning the wheel of teaching, equality of purity of intellect, equality of voice and articulation, equality of power and expertise, equality of the enlightened state, equality of universal love and compassion, equality of the spiritual metamorphoses of the inconceivable liberations of enlightening beings. Then the great enlightening being universally good, Samantha Bhadra, thus explaining courses of aeons, as many aeons as atoms in the untold Buddha lands in the successions of worlds, went on to make a vow. Now this vow, Translated vow is pranidhana, but it also can mean prayer. And pranidhana, dhana is like sudhana, like shudhodhana. Buddha's father was shudhodhana. Dhana means wealth, it can mean food, it can mean wealth, treasure, but life sustaining food. And shudhodhana, purified food, Buddha's father's name. Who, uh, who was an emanation of Manjushri, actually, it also <laughs> as revealed in the Kusugueza Manja Tantra. And Sudana is good food or bliss food, you know, bl bliss wealth. And then, and then uh, uh, Pranidhana, so Prani is like Prana possessing. So that means a living being, Prani, or having life. So the wealth of having life. So the wealth, of having, the wealth of having life, being one's vow to the goodness of all beings, to the wealth, to the happiness, to the freedom of suffering of all beings. 
to the blissfulness of reality, prani, dana, so the treasure of life devoted to that, being that actually, or realizing that life is that, that bliss is life. So that's pranidana, and you can't really decide whether it's a vow or a prayer. If you can read a prayer as making it happen by praying for it, then a or a vow as by making it happen by determining it, then it's sort of like a determining prayer, let's say, a creating determining prayer, where prayer and vow transcend the difference between them in our habitual usage, and they make it happen by praying for it, by vowing it to make it so. So that it's, and, and it's only a matter of time, and that is illusory. So in the prayer, it happens. Somehow it's this kind of prayer. So this is a holy prayer for all Mahayana Buddhists in all languages and every single one. And let's read this version of it. Let us pray this version of it. As many Buddhas as there may be in any world, Chinye Sudha Chokchu Jigdha Tusum Sanjay Mi Shekbarkun I was going to remember in Tibetan. I will read it in Tibetan, however, later. As many Buddhas as there may be in any world, throughout the ten directions, throughout past, present, and future, I honor them all without exception, pure in body, speech, and mind. With as many bodies, bodies, with as many bodies as atoms in all lands, I bow to all Buddhas, with a mind directed to all Buddhas, by the power of the vow of the practice of good. In a single atom, Buddhas as many as atoms sit in the midst of enlightening beings. So it is of all things in the cosmos, I realize all are filled with Buddhas. I laud all the Buddhas therein, expounding in all languages the qualities of all Buddhas with endless oceans of manifestation. With the finest flowers, garlands, musical instruments, perfumes, and parasols, the finest lamps and incenses I make offerings to those Buddhas. Whatever be the best of offerings, I produce them for all Buddhas, and by the power of devotion to the practice of good, I honor and serve all Buddhas. Whatever evil I may commit under the sway of passion, hatred, or folly, bodily, bodily verbally, or men mentally, I confess it all. I may have committed, commit, or, or, may, or might commit, under the sway of passion or hatred or folly, bodily, verbally, or mentally, I confess it all. And whatever the virtue of beings everywhere, I, hearers, disciples, saints, self-conquerors, enlightening beings, and Buddhas, in all that I do rejoice with no trace of envy. And all the lamps of the worlds in the ten directions who have realized enlightenment and attained non-obstruction, I seek as guides that they may turn the supreme wheel of teaching. And those who wish to manifest extinction, I petition respectfully to remain for aeons as many as atoms in the land for the welfare and happiness of all beings. By honor, service, and direction, by appreciating, seeking, and requesting teachings, whatever good I have accumulated, I dedicate it all to enlightenment. May the Buddhas of the past be honored, as well as those now in the worlds of the Ten Directions, and may those of the future be at ease, filled with joy, having realized enlightenment. May all the lands of the Ten Directions be purified, supreme, and filled with Buddhas and enlightening beings at the Tree of Enlightenment. May all beings in the Ten Directions be happy and well. May all beings' righteous aim be successful. May their hope be realized. As I am carrying out enlightenment practice, may I recall my lives in all states. In every lifetime as I die and am reborn, may I always transcend the mundane. Learning from all Buddhas, fulfilling the practice of good, I will practice pure conduct, always free from defect. I will expound the teaching in the languages of gods and dragons, in the languages of demons and humans, and of all living beings. May those engaged in the ways of transcendence not stray from enlightenment, and may all evils be inhibited, be thoroughly extinguished. 
I will traverse the paths of the world, free from compulsion, affliction, and delusion, like a lotus unstained by water, like the sun and moon unattached in the sky, extinguishing all the miseries of bad states and bringing all beings to happiness. I will act for the welfare of all beings in all lands everywhere, according with the conduct of sentient beings, while fulfilling the practice of enlightenment and cultivating the practice of good, Thus will I act throughout all future aeons. May I always be in communion with those who share my practice. Physically, verbally, and mentally, I will carry out vows as one practice. May I always be, and may I always be with my benefactors who teach me the practice of good. May I never displease them. May I always see the Buddhas face to face, surrounded by enlightening beings. I will make fine offerings to them forever, unwearied preserving the true teaching of Buddhas, illumining the practice of enlightenment, and purifying the practice of good, I will practice for all future aeons, migrating through all states of being, having acquired inexhaustible virtue and knowledge. May I become an inexhaustible treasury of wisdom and art, concentration, liberation, and all virtue. As I carry on the practice of enlightenment, may I see the inconceivable Buddhas sitting among enlightening beings in the lands as numerous as atom that are in each atom. Thus may I perceive the oceans of Buddhas and lands of all times in each point in the ten directions as I practice for myriad aeons. May I ever penetrate the eloquence of Buddhas, the voices of all Buddhas which adapt to mentalities, the purity of articulation of all Buddhas by the sounds of the ocean of tones in a single utterance. Into those infinite voices of all Buddhas of all times, may I enter by Buddha power, turning the wheel of teaching. May I enter all aeons of the future instantly, and may I act in all aeons of all times within an instant. May I see all Buddhas of all times in one instant and always enter their sphere by the magical power of liberation. May I produce the arrays of all lands of all times in an atom. May I thus perceive all the arrays of Buddha lands in all the ten directions, learning the teachings of the lamps of the world to come. I visit all the guides who have passed away to eternal rest. By occult powers, swift in all ways, by the power of knowledge, all-sided, by the power of practice with all virtues, by the power of universal love, by the power of goodness, all pure, by the power of knowledge unobstructed, gathering the power of enlightenment, clearing away the power of acts, destroying the power of addictions, visit vitiating the power of demons. May I fulfill all powers of the practice of universal good purifying oceans of lands, liberating oceans of beings, observing oceans of truths, plumbing oceans of knowledge, perfecting oceans of practice, perfecting oceans of vows, serving oceans of Buddhas. May I practice untiring for oceans of aeons. The lofty vows of enlightenment practice of the Buddhas of past, present, and future. May I fulfill completely practice what is good and realize enlightenment. All who share in the practice of the sage of universal good, Samantabhadra, the foremost offspring of all Buddhas, I name them good, pure in body, speech, and mind, pure in conduct with the pure land, as is the sage named good. May I become thus equally. May I carry out the vow of Manjushri to purely purify the practice of good, tireless through all future ages, May I fulfill all those tasks. May there be no limits to practice and no limit to virtues. Persisting in infinite practices, I know all their miraculous creation. As long as the earth exists, as long as all beings exist, as long as acts and addictions exist, so long will my vow remain. Let me give the Buddhas of all worlds in the ten directions adorned with jewels, let me give celestials and humans supreme happiness for aeons as many as atoms. Those who develop respect and devotion on hearing this supreme dedication, seeking supreme enlightenment, will be most blessed. They will have abandoned all evils and all bad associates and will quickly see infinite light if they have the vow of enlightening practice. Great is their gain, worthwhile their life, Auspicious their birth as humans, they will soon be like the universally good enlightening being Samantabhadra Bodhisattva. 
Those who have committed hellish crimes under the sway of ignorance will quickly put an end to them all with this practice of good when this practice of good is expounded, endowed with knowledge, distinction, and nobility, invulnerable to false teachers and demons, they will be honored by all in the triple world. They will quickly go to the tree of enlightenment and sit there for the benefit of all living beings. They will realize enlightenment, turn the wheel of teaching, and conquer the devil and all its cohorts. Buddha knows those who hold this vow to practice good, who cause it to be told of and taught. The fruit of this is supreme enlightenment. Do not entertain any doubt. As the hero Manju Shri knows, so too does universal good. As I learn from them, I dedicate all this virtue by the supreme dedication praised by the Buddhas of all times. I dedicate their, all this virtue to the practice of highest good. Acting in accord with the time, may I remove all obstructions. May I see infinite light face to face and go to the land of bliss. There may all these vows be complete. Having fulfilled them, I will work for the weal of all beings in the world. Let me abide in the circle of that Buddha, born in a beautiful lotus, and receive the prophecy of Buddhahood there in the presence of the Buddha of infinite light. Having received the prophecy there with millions of emanations, I will work for the weal of beings everywhere by the power of Buddha. By whatever virtue I accumulate, having invoked the vow to practice good, May the pure aspiration of the world be at once all fulfilled. By the endless surpassing blessing realized from dedication to the practice of good, may worldlings submerged in the torrent of passion go to the higher realm of infinite light. Then the Buddha said, Sudhana, those enlightening beings led by Manjushri, the monks developed by Manjushri, Maitreya, and all the enlightening beings of the age of virtue. The great enlightening beings gathered in various worlds as numerous as atoms, led by universally good Samantabhadra, appointed inheritors of spiritual sovereignty. The great disciples led by Shariputra and Maudgalyayana and their circle, as well as celestial and human beings, were related and they applauded what the blessed enlightening being, universally good, had said. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And so we did dedicate this effort in the prayer itself. That is the dedication of universally good Samantha Bhadra Bodhisattva here with us and in every universe, in every atom here with us. And in every, every atom of every universe, in every atom, in every atom, in every universe, in every atom, in every universe, in every atom, in every universe, in every atom. <laughs> so dedicated. Make it so. Thank you all so much. I want to thank especially Pyotr Redlinsky, who sat with me through all of this and recorded it and, you know, polished it and did whatever. And he sent it to Justin Stone Diaz, who I want to thank for then publishing it in such and such a way. And I want to thank Odysseus, uh, Odysseus who, who, who allowed this to happen and for whom I will dedicate the soundtrack as an as a, uh, uh, audible, if he wishes to have that from here for his press as long as he gets a good royalty to the widow of dear Tom. And I want to thank Michael Burbank, who envisaged uh, and who planned to record me reading this, which really was not a normal thing to do. But uh, anyway, he did that. I want to thank him for that. And of course, my Nena, who allowed it to happen and who makes it all happen. So and all beings and all our children and relatives, all the Samantha Badras everywhere, and all the beings who are living just in the body of Samantha Badra, whose hand touches their head, pats them on the head eventually. 
Okay, thank you. Okay. Oh, oh, wait, one more last thing. I just want to announce that I also plan, it is said that, you know, another of my favorite sutras, which is the Vimalakirti Nirdesha Sutra, the sutra uh, outsourced by Shakyamuni Buddha to the Bodhisattva or the Buddha Vimalakirti, who is in himself came from the Abhirati universe of the Buddha Akshobhya, from the beyond as many universes as there are grains of sand in 62 Ganges riverbeds to the east, the great Buddha land of the east, Buddhaverse of the east, is said to be a drop of the water of the ocean of the, of the flower ornament. The flower ornament of the ocean and the Vimalakirti is a drop from that ocean. So it's very suitable and fitting, I think. I want to add to the collection, even though I'm not yet dead, in honor of myself <laughs> and everybody else who translated the Vimalakirti at any time and who read it, I want to also do a series of uh, reading and commentary on that sutra. But I'm not sure when, I, if I will do it just continuously. Maybe, but uh, uh, it depends on whether people can do that. So I'm going to do that, though. I'm just expressing my intention to do that. And, uh, and that will be my joy. And I will share it with everyone who is interested. Okay? So that's also going to happen. Thank you.